Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about extraordinary experiences of everyday people. And today, our guest is Paulina Howfield. Welcome, Paulina. Thank you very much, Julie, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and have a conversation with you today. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I know you've been having some rough weather, but we made it. Yay, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> yeah, mine's got together to help, yes. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, Paulina, could you uh, share just a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, I'm a, um, an ordinary person, which is perfect for this. I'm an ordinary person, but I've had some, I guess what extraordinary things might, you might say extraordinary things happening in my life, but I, like you, try to make them ordinary because I think it is, we are all extraordinary. So from the point of view of my experiences as a, a child, I just, um, I've always had experiences. I've always known that there was another side. I've always known that, um, that we're more than our bodies. And I've always known that there were past lives and that um, there was an afterlife. Now, as my life has progressed, I've learned more about that and I would be able to be more articulate about that than when I was younger. But those things were always present. And I, I grew up in a family that um, uh, um, Celtic and, um, and um, I never felt boxed in by my beliefs or anything like that, but I didn't share them. And I didn't share them because they were happening to me. And I just, in a way, assumed that they were happening for everybody. But then I realized at a point of time, they weren't happening for everybody. And then I kind of just kept them to myself, partly because I just did. It wasn't a, a big decision I made that I couldn't share them. I just didn't share them. Um, so I've had experiences all my life. And it's been something that I now, now realize has been drawing me to a deeper understanding of consciousness, deeper understanding of the afterlife and how to navigate that upon death mm. and how to really develop our deep cosmic memory so that we can all be fully galactically consciously aware. Wow. Okay. I, I'm so curious. So as a child, a young child, you intuitively knew that we were not our, that we were more than our bodies and, and even past lives. Did you have memories of past lives? Um, I would say that I had a sense of past lives rather than individual memories. Okay. Um, now I would say I had individual memories, but as a child, I knew, I just knew. Wow. I knew that past lives. And because because I hit, could hear voices, you know, you've got to be careful when you say that. Yeah. <laughs> but I could hear voices and I could sense dead people. And um, there were also other things going on. I just knew that there was an invisible world. Okay. And if there's an invisible world, that means that we're not the body. Right. Just, or just the body. That yeah. means we're more than that. And it also means that, I, and I just knew that reincarnation was real. I never had any doubt about it. Like when I was young, I was reading things like Lord Sang Rampa about, and I remember about eight or nine reading about, um, in one of Lord Sang's book, he talks about the opening and activation of the third eye. And I really knew and resonated with that. Wow. Now that uh, and I read books like um, Chalky, John, a lot of John Wyndham books, books about, um, children having experiences with invisible so-called invisible friends or um, the chrysalids where children are telepathically communicating across the planet and across the cosmos so all those things for me were really mm. relevant to me because I just knew instinctively um, mm -hmm. that there was something else and that we were part of something else and that um, in some ways that made me feel like I didn't belong and I didn't fit in mm. So your siblings were not like you in this way? Not that I'm aware of. No, mm. not that I'm aware of. Because, and mom and dad, um, they they were not. No, no, either they weren't. mediums or <laughs> psychic no, or anything. No, but I, I mean, my mother was definitely connected in, mm. uh, and in later life, we talked about certain things. But um, 
yeah, she definitely had a connection in. And uh, um, I would say on my father's side, further back, uh, there, there were, but it wasn't really something that mm. was talked about in, in at home. Okay. And you said you not only heard, but did you say you, you would see people that were, um, had passed on as a child? Yes, I'm, I'm, prim my primary thing of picking things up has always been kinesthetic, so sensing things. Mm, okay. And I'll smell things. Mm. So like if I see a movie or uh, something else, I'll sm and someone's smoking a cigarette, I'll uh -huh. smell the cigarette. Or Ooh. if there's smoking, uh, sorry, drinking uh, something, I will smell it. Or if there's a gun goes off, I will smell that. So wow. that's always been there. Okay. Um, I will um, I will sense things, and um, also um, I hear things. Now, because mm. I don't know, um, most people have one thing that they're predominantly um, connecting in with one okay. point, and it may be visual, it may be oral, or it may be kinesthetic, mm -hmm. and we can develop it so that we can have a bit of all of them. Mm. Um, but kinesthetics predominantly my way and visuals in there but it's more a, a sensing of the visual but sometimes I'll have the visual as well so as I've got older the visuals come in more but when I was younger it was the sensing so the kind yeah. of thing when you walk into a room and you know someone's there and then or they come into the room and you know they're there <coughs> which is more what would happen is they would come into the room and I would know they were there but then I saw yeah. things as well so when I was wow. um, when I was about uh, five, six, um, a witch came into my room, and she came in in the corner of the room. It was it was night. It was dark, and um, she just appeared in the corner of the you know the juxtapoint of the excuse me <coughs> the juxtapoint of the ceiling in the walls came oh. in the corner so she was up in the ceiling wow section. okay okay and she was in mist and she was in stardust and she was a classic looking witch with a long nose and a, wow. and a long hair and <laughs> okay sort of like warty looking face and oh. um, she was cackling at me mm. and it took many years to fully establish who she was and what she was doing, but she came and she, after that first time, she came regularly for a period of time. Okay. So I definitely saw her and I definitely felt her. It, was this a positive her. presence or a negative presence? It sounds <laughs> negative. Well, it frightened me for sure. You're just a kid. But, yeah, it frightened this time. me. But it, it was also, um, again I realized over a period of time she wasn't harming me she was just watching me hmm. okay watching. <laughs> but she was cackling <laughs> interesting she was okay cackling. she was cackling absolutely so there were things that I did see and then there was there were things that I felt predominantly and sometimes when you're really young and you know there's something there and you can feel it but you can't see it mm -hmm. sometimes that's even more scary yeah or just as scary <laughs> mm-hmm just so I'm I'm curious now so you you did you develop these skills did you embrace these as you grew older some kids they learn okay let's put those aside and they ignore them and they push them down as they grow up but you you embrace them yeah I embrace them I I, I kind of in a way I didn't really think about whether I embraced them or, or dropped them they were just there and they were they were a part of my everyday reality so like if if um if there was an accident i might sense that there was going to be an accident mm. uh, if people were going to be injured i might sense that and that might be in the immediacy of people i knew or myself mm. or it might be in like a global thing that might happen um okay. or an understanding of why that global thing may have happened would would suddenly kind of come in huh um, I had experiences as a teenager and I, and then in my early twenties, I had a lot of experiences that were happening. So things like, um, one of the, one, one thing that happened with, I used to, uh, walk along, um, in a Hampstead park in, in London. Um, 
and I'd walk at night along there and partly because there was no other way to get from A to B except walking at, at certain times, not because I liked walking through a dark and dreary park at night. <laughs> um, and there were pathways, but there were no lights on them. And uh, if I could, I'd catch a bus, but there wasn't always a bus. So like I said, to get from A to B, I'd walk along the pathway, stick as close to the road as I could. And, and one night I was walking along there and I was thinking, and, and a man jogging came past me. He got a fright because I was suddenly there and I got a fright because he was suddenly there. And in my fright, I thought, I wish there were lights here. And this light came on. And I thought, oh, okay, there must be a, I've never seen this before here, but there must be a light, act, a foot, some foot or person censored, you know, light that suddenly comes on in a particular place. And that's what I assumed it happened. And um, so every time I walked along that particular section after that, the light came on, it, not during the day, but at night. Sure. And um, I just thought that that, that was, uh, a new thing that they put in anyway months later I was walking along there with a friend and the light came on and he went oh there's a light here and I said well that light's been here for months and he said no no I've never seen it before and then we did an experiment and he would walk along and then other people would walk along and it only ever happened when they were walking along with me so oh. I realized that. wow that, and we made it became a bit of a standard joke the best way person to go anywhere is with Paulina because you'll be safe but it was, I, I, there were things like that happened that there was, there was a sense of being protected mm. and, not, and not, not protected in a um, I'm special way, but protected in that there was something going on. There was another thing going on that people were looking over because they had um, sort of sense of something that I was, um, uh, something they were watching over me for. Mm. And uh, um contact experiences of all different sorts of things and I had um what would be termed ETs visiting and the watchers who would watch me and they um they were they were watchers so a lot of the stuff that I had as a child really were experiences of talking and being with people and recognizing dead people but it wasn't until when I was older and then I then had a lot of things happen in my 20s and then I had the the near death and then a lot of things went after that that I could see that it was all part of a an, a consciousness plan if you like yeah it's like you don't just have one thing that happens to right it. yeah and 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 the the spiritually transformative experiences that a lot, a lot of people are now talking about right it's like these happen in a cumulative way mm. they're like helping us grow they're helping mm. us change and they're helping us learn more mm -hmm. so that was kind of how how it's been for me that um each experience comes on the back of the other experience in a way yeah yeah and each of those potentially is a bit of an initiation experience it can be so the near-death experience let's let's kind of move into that if if you would um that sounds like it really started to open things up after that um yeah and you were what about what age were you then when i this... was uh, about 25 would you mind just kind of leading us up to that and then taking us through that experience sure well, um, part of my journey had always been that I was going to, after I'd finished university, I was going to travel. And that, that for me was just in my nature and has been in my nature ever since, all my life. And that's also part of my um, spiritually transformative lifestyle and experiences. Um, so I was moving around the planet at the time that um, I then ended up living in Israel and um, I was yeah. feeling very, I'd been in Turkey having some past life experiences and I moved into Israel. And while I was there, I um, had a, something happening in my stomach, which I was putting down to dodgy water that I'd drunk at some point. As you tra when, you, when you travel, you know, you can get a dodgy tummy from something. Mm -hmm. But it persisted. And um, in the end, I ended up going to see a couple of specialists and I was told that I had a, a cyst on an ovary. 
and they said to me or the person said to me be careful with it because it might rupture and I, mm. and, and if it does it's an emergency get to somebody as soon as possible and I remember when I was leaving the offices and then um, heading back to the community that I was living in thinking, well, I, I wonder how you know if it ruptures, like what happens if it ruptures? Turns out it's really easy to know what happens because that evening it ruptured. And um, it, <coughs> excuse me, it sent like shock waves and pain waves through my body. Mm. And I felt like I'd been given an, um, um, like someone had injected me with some kind of weird drug. That's kind of what, what happened immediately. And then it was just mm. a lot of pain. Mm. And then as I was trying to, I was trying to breathe because I couldn't breathe and I was, and, and I knew I was in a serious problem. I also thought I need to try and get to the hospital. So I was in a community where I needed to figure out if I could find someone who could take me to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and uh, in that process, someone went off to find somebody for me. And then I ended up being taken by the community nurse and the and a person who's a student doctor who was driving the car. Mm. And we got into the car because we were going to the hospital. And I was struggling to breathe and I knew I wasn't well and I wasn't frightened, but I was um, aware that it was a difficult situation and I needed to concentrate and focus. But I also knew that um, um, when the woman in the, the nurse said to me, get, uh, if you get in the back of the car and lay down, I knew if I lay down, that wasn't a good move. I knew that I wouldn't survive that. Hmm. And I don't know why I knew that, but I knew. And hmm. so I'm tall and I couldn't fit. I couldn't lay down in the back seat anyway. But so I put my head against the back window and my legs as much as I could across the seat bent, with bent legs. And it was actually really nice having my head resting against the window, which was cooler because I was feeling a lot of heat and a lot of distress in the body. Right. And as we drove out of the property and it was about 20, 25 minutes, I think, to the car, to the hospital, um, I was I had my head against the car. It was late at night, so I was looking at the stars and concentrated on breathing. Mm -hmm. And this, um, and I was just breathing and concentrating and feeling the coolness on the, of the window. When it's almost like I felt a blue eye come to. Uh, at the top of my third eye and the top of my head and kind of began to draw me out but at the same time it was like I went out in stages so I was in the car and then I was watching outside the car and I could I was just above it then I was kind of gently rising up and with each breath I kind of went up okay and I went each physical breath. breath were you still feeling your physical body at the same um, time and at that point, yes. And then shortly afterwards, no. Okay. But at that point, it was like I was still there and then I wasn't. <coughs> and I was out in, so I, I went out and I could see above the car and I could see the, roo the rooftops and I could see the treetops. And, th and then I went above that and I could see the occupants in the car, my body in the back seat hmm. and all the, um, like, the towns in the distance. So I was getting higher and higher. And mm -hmm. Like I've been in a hot air balloon. So a hot air balloon is about 3000 feet, I think. So it, it was like um, getting higher than that. And then I just shot out into space. Um, okay. And I was in space in the stars. And I could see the planets and I could feel, hear the feel and hear the sound of what would be called the audible scream like it was quite loud but it was I could hear the vacuums of noise and the sounds okay wow but it was also so it was loud and uh, but also quiet it was very interesting because it's like full of polarities it hmm. was quiet but it was loud um hmm. and as I was going through into the space there was a wonderment for me because I was thinking wow if anybody asked me anything about anything I think I know the answer 
And I was like, it was like, oh, wow. So this is about a knowingness and, and a consciousness. And then the wind whipped through my body and then the fire whipped through my body and then the air whipped through my body and then the earth whipped through my body. So the four elements primarily just okay. straight through. Earth, wind, water. Fire, fire water. Fire, okay. So I'm in the sea of consciousness, which I guess would be the ethers at this point. This is what I'm thinking. So I'm in this place where I'm in a library of consciousness and that's the sea of consciousness. It's like this of the answers to everything that exists in the universe in that place. Mm. Um, and we're all part of that. So I was becoming aware that I'm definitely not my body. None of us are our <laughs> body. Definitely not my body. I'm not my thoughts either. None of us are our thoughts. Uh, I'm not my emotions either because I could feel my emotions from like I could sense that there were emotions that they were not me but I became absolutely clear we're not our mind we're not our thoughts and not our body we are consciousness experiencing itself and that at the foundation of all of this is absolute profound love so I'm still in the stars then I'm in this like the best way to describe it is a corridor of light um, but it's like fluffy clouds <clears throat> and uh, um, the corridor had doors in it and I knew that each door led into information and almost like Akashic records or information about different things and the doors were swinging so it's like the information was just accessible to me I was just receiving and downloads and, um, oh. and accessing the full memory of past lives and deep cosmic memory as well so all of that was going on and I was just in wonder um, and in awe of it and feeling like I'd come home. This was really familiar to me. I was home. And um, then I was just experiencing that. And I don't know how long I was in that experience for. And um, I then felt something tug at my tug at something which was somebody the person in the car realizing that there was no pulse so she was tugging at my wrist mm. and then she was tugging trying to reach my neck to check my neck pulse and I came back in huh okay and then over the next few days I left a few times and I was struggling to stay in my body you were at the hospital I yeah I uh, well I well, yeah I went to the hospital and then afterwards and I was struggling to stay in hmm. and I knew that I needed water and not water to drink, although water to drink is helpful. I knew that I needed water on the body uh, and I knew because I knew that it was to do, you know, when you know things, but you don't know how you know those things sometimes, but you just know absolutely, sure. you know, mm -hmm. so I knew that um, it was a magnetic electrical frequency issue. And I also knew that my oversoul um, in, the, in the experience that I'd had, the frequencies had changed to such, de such a degree that um, the oversoul was going to be working in a different way with me from now on, but it couldn't stay in the body because it was still trying to adjust. And I knew that the water would help. So mm. I went, um, I wasn't really able to walk much. So I crawled across the floor and got into the shower and turned the shower on and then just let the water run over wow. and as soon as that happened I started to feel like I could get back in properly interesting and I could then start to integrate everything so that um I could then be the me that I was going to be the new Paulina <laughs> new and improved Paulina or something <laughs> hopefully improved <laughs> <laughs> hopefully improved yeah um and so that's that's pretty much that in in a nutshell. And then I had, and I needed to recover from the the things that had happened and and integrate that. And so it um, mm. it was an integration process, and it is actually for the rest of our lives. I think after those things, there's there's always an integration. There's always something else you learn. And yeah. I knew that the thing about the four directions was really important. Yeah, that's different. Um, I don't think I've heard that. Yeah, I knew that was really important, and I um, and it was. I was also interested in um, because I or, already believed that past lives existed and so on. I mean, if you'd have said to me you're going to have a 
a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience or whatever people want to call that experience is fine with me. I know what it felt like for me. Um, but, but I never thought that I was going to have that kind of experience. But I, um, it really um, clarified everything for me in mm. order to... <coughs> sorry. <That's okay. coughs> in order for me to be able to do what I came to do what in this life and continue on. So the STEs are a continuation on, as I mm. said, they're cumulative. And lifetimes are cumulative. Huh. So we learn things in our lives that become part of that journey towards total conscious recall and total cosmic memory. And, and, the, and the, the work that I've come to do is a part of that. And so the experiences with the afterlife was really about understanding um, how the, we're made from matter, earth, air, fire, and water, how that mm. comes into being. Okay. And that was part of that experience was to really understand that mm. and then really understand how, you, how we navigate that after death. Mm. And um, some years later, I was at a Buddhist, um, oh, I was at a gathering of monks, actually, and uh, they, one of them was talking about how they work to navigate the afterlife. And there was stuff that was spoken in that that I don't think they n normally talk about. Um, and for, for some of the monks, it's, uh, well, maybe all of them, it's uh, something that they're aspiring to throughout their life so they can die well and that they can mm. um, leave the body and leave the body consciously. And I okay. know in um, Indigenous cultures, they talk about similar things as well and in returning back to the stars, as they would call it. Um, Your near death, it, I'm so, so sorry. Did you say you had had an out-of-body experience before this near-death experience or you had never been out of body as far as you knew? In, in sleep form, but not in day-to-day um, -day form, day-to-day yeah. okay. -day living. Not that I'm aware of, but I, you know, like I said, sometimes we remember things and we don't know that we've had it. And it's like a lot of, often with these experiences, you remember later stuff that happened that you didn't at the time. Right. And I've come across many people who said they had near deaths when they were younger, but didn't realize it till they had a near death when they were older. Yes, absolutely. Um. Mm. So I'm I'm kind of interested in this idea of ha, ha, learning how to die well, and part of the monks, um, it sounds like part of their their philosophy is to learn how to go out of body. Is that what you were saying? They would try to practice that to help them navigate what it would be like to yeah. go to to be dead <laughs> when your physical yeah, body dies. Because they talk about the bar though. You know, it's like it's how to navigate those after the, the afterlife realms and <laughs> okay, um, you know, this is how interesting. To get through, how to safely get through the astral realms, how to safely get through and back into a state of consciousness and eventually get back to source. Wow. Okay, so would you mind? Do you know the difference, or have you been told the difference between the afterlife and the astral realms? Because it sounds like the astral realms is a location that we can kind of get caught up in if after death and mm. not make quite make it to the afterlife. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, the astral realm, like um, there are many dimensions in the universes, many dimensions in the universe. And most people are aware of maybe the fact that there's three, four, five you know, the third dimension, the fourth dimension is the astral realms and the fifth dimension is another frequency, but there's many, many different realms. And so in a way, the astral realm is a part of our psyche. It's where the archetypal resonances are, but it's just, it's only just outside our skin, the astral realms, which is where a lot of, a lot of the contact with dead beings or hauntings comes from is that they're in the astral realms. And the astral realms is, as I mentioned, the, the place where a lot of mythology and archetypal resonances and frequencies are. Hmm. So if you're, if you're frightened of something, if you haven't integrated something, that's often a, an astral realm issue. 
Hmm. And when we're navigating out of the human body back to source, going through the astral realms, it's like um, in and in shamanic cultures and in indigenous cultures and spiritual cultures, when you're learning how to navigate the other realms, mm -hmm. it's like you need to figure out what frightens you. You need to figure out what's pushing you, what's driving you, mm. because all of those things in the afterlife you will meet <coughs> in some shape or form, perhaps. Now, the closest I can get to try and explain that, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, is that um, the monks were talking about exploring the elements of earth, air, fire and water and the, the, the levels of how the gods manifest how different things manifest so that when you see it as you're going through the afterlife, you can navigate it and know that you are safe and then keep moving through it and keep moving through it to return back home to source. Does that make sense? Um, okay, I'm just trying to follow this whole idea of, so the astral realms are part of the afterlife experience. So after, because when people go out of body and they astral project um, and they use the term the astral realms and or different dimensions. Mm. Um, and they sometimes meet up with their loved ones. Yes. So is this sort of a, it, some have explained it like the afterlife dimension is one frequency, the astral realm, is realms are at on a different a lower yes. frequency and they kind of have to meet somewhere in between to to yes. visit yes. with your so loved one like the sea of consciousness is is a frequency that's so different to anything most people live in on a, we live it we all have it in us but we don't live in it from day to day because we don't realize we're part of it sure so part of this journey is is remembering that we're part of that sea of consciousness and if we're part of that sea of consciousness then it's not that the astral realms become irrelevant, but the navigating through them become, it, it is like you're just taking a pathway through. Mm. Whereas if you haven't done that, then you're, you're likely to get a bit like in human life, you can get distracted by the pretty things, or you can <laughs> get distracted by the terrible things, uh -huh. or you can get distracted by the spiritual glamorous things. Hmm. You, know, you know, the distractions are there, and then um, it, it, it just makes the journey um, harder and more navigable. But I think what, what's also important in this is that um, what I've been involved with for lifetimes is the esoteric and the historic that's been the history that's been lost but the esoteric and the ancient information about navigating these realms and mm. accessing the divine feminine and accessing the real truth of our history hmm. and the truth of the connection that we have that is also part of that that has been lost and that has been deliberately mm. lost because if we're disconnected we live a different life than if we are consciously connected. Mm -hmm. And so lifetime after lifetime, this has been part of my focus and also uh, assisting in the clearing of the archetypal resonances and the collective consciousness resonances, uh, connecting in with the soul of the earth and um, participating in keeping the earth frequencies clean and clear hmm. and the archetypal gods and energies so we can all remember where we came from because as you know on this journey right now a lot of people have forgotten who we really are mm -hmm. now this near-death experience it, it from what i understand it sort of um propelled you it 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 helped you focus in on your purpose is that true yeah yeah, and, and I, when I first um, kind of came back, apart from I needed to do things for myself, I went off to do some more study because I, I, I thought um, I'd always been very much drawn to nonverbal and, and then, um, ways of interacting and that's that kinesthetic and things. So I thought I'm going to do transpersonal art therapy and, I, and then I can help people better with that. Mm. Um, I was also 
then be, I also then became a past life regression therapist and spent a lot of time doing that. And I was doing shamanic training. Okay. And, and I was doing as a mediumship. Now, a lot of those things were actually really more about having remembered that stuff from previous lives. I just mm. needed to like tap in to make okay. sure that I was on track. And also in the process of integrating the near death, it's like these things take time. So it, that was the development and the progression. So remembering things from previous lives mm -hmm. enabled more of that um, experience of the near death to make sense. Not that it didn't make sense, but another level of sense came forward. Hmm. When you were out there and you had sort of all knowledge or you just felt at peace and at one with everything like you had no que questions or if a question came up you felt like you would just know the answer did you bring a lot of that back <laughs> or you did yeah 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 and there's a knowingness that's never gone so if um, you had to sum up the purpose of gosh how do i say it? source what's the what's the purpose of source ultimate source consciousness why why not just sit in in oneness and not have all these because i know there's this understanding that we're, we're all um fractals or pieces of source consciousness expre expressing itself and experiencing itself um you know was there a time that it was not experiencing itself and or is it is that part of the definition of source it, it, in, infinitely experiencing itself I see it as infinitely experiencing itself, consciousness infinitely experiencing itself, and that it's um, we're all unique patterns of that consciousness. And the thing about that, rather than um, what's the what's the purpose of it, is that within it uh, is the journey of how to let go like really experience that love the foundation of love that is all that is and that's non-conditional and unconditional and mm. um because <clears throat> if you're in that experience then um the uniqueness of each person gets seen for what it is because we live in a world that wants everyone to conform and be the same and what that then does is actually separates and um, clarifies and quantifies things and it places judgment on everything. But consciousness experiencing itself is experiencing itself for the joy of the experience and the learning. So we come in as souls to have a 3D body experience for learning and growth, whatever that may mean. And, and, and it may mean that we, um, it can mean anything because it's consciousness experiencing itself so there's no judgment in that so when like when you get home it's like it's not like there's well you did this wrong and you did that wrong it's like wow how was it did you enjoy it what did you learn what did you get from that experience mm -hmm. um and so consciousness experiencing itself just continues in these cycles and and then there's bigger cycles. So there's these cycles of evolution of consciousness experiencing itself. And we are part of that and we are not separate from it. And, and having a body makes us feel separate, but we're not. And I know you have experience with ETs. Um, would you say it's the same for them? It's the con source consciousness experiencing itself and it's still it's related to, to learning how to love? or to experience love for all the ETs that you're familiar with, I guess. I guess there's probably many, many, um, I, but. Yeah, I couldn't say that for, I, I couldn't say that for all, I mean, everything is part of consciousness experiencing itself. I'm, I'm, I feel that deeply, but I think um, different species and different consciousnesses or different experiences of that consciousness have different reasons for doing things. Hmm. Um, but always the yeah. foundation of love is that i personally believe there is a foundation of love behind everything um and so 
that's the great that's one of the greatest lessons really is if everything is the foundation of love then everything that we feel that is not love is illusion hmm. that's interesting that's very interesting and if that's illusion then what's real mm. and then you kind of can get end up in that spiral of how mm -hmm. does the mind work and how to and um what's real and what's not real and you know, it's a fine line between staying sane <laughs> and, um, yeah. and you only have to look through history to see that there has people who are very close to it because we are all an aspect of the divine spark experiencing itself I'd like to ask you something going back to um, reincarnation, because I know that a lot of my listeners um, have questions about reincarnation. Number one, uh, do we have free will? Do we have to come back? Because, and the main reason is um, for asking this is because they want to they want to see their loved ones on the other side. They want to experience the afterlife with their loved ones. Do you have any thoughts about that? Do we get to hang out? Do our loved ones who have passed on before us get to wait for us, or do they have to reincarnate right away? Okay. There's there's lots of layers to that question, um, and uh, um, for me. Um, reincarnation is a part of free will and the beings that i have interactions with um the so-called ets and the inner earth beings and the ray masters and all being all beings work with the idea that it is free will and that um we make those choices to come back and we make the choices because as beings who when we return back to source, we realize that we want to do it again because we have things to learn from. And it's not about the family dynamic relationships. It's about something much bigger than that. And so when we're in a human form, we want to be with our family or we want to be with our friends or we want to be with those humans. That's part of the human dynamic but actually reincarnation is much bigger than that. It's about um, as a soul, how we grow and how we change and how we understand where we came from and what we're participating in and the cycles of those things that we're participating in. So free will is absolutely an important part of that. And many human beings want freedom of choice and personal responsibility. And I think one of the things that we see a lot on the planet right now is people struggling with actually taking personal choice, having self-responsibility. And many people feel that there are, those things are being taken away. Um, and also the flip of that is people not being able to take personal responsibility and self-responsibility and personal choice. And so some people are relying on ETs to come and rescue us. Right. Or God will fix it. Right. Or um, my husband or my partner or my, you know, whatever. Yeah. Someone will fix it. They, my boss will fix it or the government will fix it. <laughs> right. You know, there's, there's lots of that in our human um, psyche. And so these are the things that we're working through so that we can be fully liberated free will beings and that that doesn't relate to um whether or not our mother or our father or our brother or our sister is dead and wanting to see that and i know that sounds like um disappointing um and but it's so much bigger than that it, it's not down to individual relationships necessarily it can be, but generally it's not. Hmm. Well, as a, you're a medium, mm. correct? Yes. Sorry. Yes. So, um, so <laughs> you have contacted spirit, mm. loved ones mm. that have passed, been gone for what's the longest amount of time, and they're still not reincarnated, and they're on the other side. What would you say? Fifty years, twenty years. I mean, have you talked to spirits who have been 
over in the afterlife for decades. Thousands, thousands yeah. and millions of years. Yeah. And they haven't reincarnated yet. No, or, or they've been reincarnated, but they've gone to a different place. They don't like they don't necessarily come to Earth. Well, that was my next question. So, OK, so so they can hang out in the afterlife for quite a long time in terms of our understanding of time. Well, I would say they're they're in um, in the other realms, not necessarily the afterlife. OK, because okay. It's, it's just a different form of of consciousness. So when we speak, like if your mother comes to see you, say if your mother's passed and your mother comes to see you, it may be your mother actually coming, but it may be an aspect of your mother coming. Because she may be. Because she's doing something else now. She's gone on to a different life or she's gone on to a different experience okay. in some way. So it's like the particle, the nanoparticle or that, that okay. aspect. Like your mother would know how to show up to you. And like, even if she's, um, even if within her soul form, uh, she was a triangle or a, an ET of some description, she's not necessarily going to show up to you like that unless you're at a place within your own conscious awareness that you can cope with that. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they will present themselves according to what, what your imprint of them is. Your genetic, your your genetic or your energetic imprint of them. So consciousness continues on, and if we, you know, if we're experiencing different lifetimes at different points, or or time is irrelevant, then it's like there's always the spark that will meet the other spark. Mm. And when you said um, you could, it sounded like you're saying we could reincarnate onto another planet. Absolutely. And be an ET. I mean, anything that's not on Earth, I guess, is ET, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, we, we, the, it, it comes down like, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> we have a lot of discussions uh, now about star seeding. And, yeah. and certainly as a star seed myself, I can, and, and um, one of the waves of star seeds that came earlier than, than some of the newer star seeds, but it's, it's that sense of it's about understanding that we all come from the stars. We are all seeded from the stars, but we were all seeded as a designer um, project. And so whatever's in mm. that seeding is going to be a part of our genetic makeup. And so we may, we may manifest on different planets or in different ways, in different places. And some people have never had an incarnation on earth before. Other people like me, I've incarnated on earth many times um, and in other places as well. So it, it's that sense of the only, in a way, I think the only limit to consciousness is our belief that consciousness is limited. <laughs> And that's a tricky one because mm -hmm. what that then does is it means anything and everything can happen. I like that idea though. <laughs> and we're, we're only limited by the belief that we think there is some kind of limitation or some box that it has to fit into. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting out of time. I don't want to stop this conversation. Can I just ask you, I don't know if this will be a real quick question answer. Oversoul. So when you said you were talking about the oversoul wanting to not tr being able to stick <laughs> going yeah. back into you, does, is that the same as a soul? When people say my soul, this and my soul, that my soul exited my um, soul. It, 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 it's, it's not quite the same thing because the oversoul is, is, is a bit like, you know, I mentioned the watchers before who are watching and guiding the oversoul is a, is a bit like that. It's an, it's a higher resonance, a higher frequency. Okay. And, it, and it, it's not the higher self. It's not the higher self. It's a different thing to that. And it's a, at a very different frequency to that. But it, it kind of manages in a way and guides how things happen. But in my instance, it was going to be present to allow me to do the electrical frequency work that I do. So like in the, oh. in the earth energy work and the healing work and the mediumship and the psychic work and, and those sorts of things, that the frequencies changed and so the oversoul energy needed to stay in the body 
So not everybody has the oversoul energy in their body. I wouldn't say in their body, no. I'd say I, they can act, you can access it, but actually it physically or it's, it's really tricky, these conversations and good question. It's really tricky because um, the soul is intangible. Therefore, the oversoul is intangible and it's in the body, but it's not of the body. But in this instance, I was really aware that the oversoul was struggling and I needed to do something in order to help it better resonate and work through the levels of the body. I think a, a, f a friend of mine has a, the definition of an oversoul this way, and I don't okay. think this is what you're saying. So there's this oversoul and it will, um, the higher selves, that incarnate come out of the oversoul so so to speak incarnate on earth and then the higher self is still so the higher self incarnates so julie for example i would still have a higher self on the other side that i'm connected to here's julie individualized having this life the higher self is i'm still connected to which is on the other side and then when i julie the physical body julie dies i take all of julie's memories go back to the higher self and then the higher self can either incarnate again or go back to the oversoul i think that's yeah. what he was saying does that make sense or, and is that different than your understanding yeah it, it does make sense and and i like countries have an oversoul and collective communities have an oversoul so um that that's for me where the resonance with what he's saying is there's an oversoul that we link into and and mm -hmm. that that's a part of that but something for in this for me was i was clear that there was something about the thread of the oversoul mm -hmm. was not able to fully come in mm -hmm. to this frequency interesting yeah and it needed me to have it so that it could work in the freedom of being able to do what i came to do without the confines of a physical body mm -hmm. And many people find that they're confined in a physical body. So they can't access different dimensions necessarily because of the confines of a physical body. Yes. But the physical body can't hold that particular frequency. You know, so like some people say they can go and do some work in the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension, but they have to stop and they can. In my particular case, I can go in all different dimensions. Hmm. And the important thing, I think, is to stay grounded in that. So if I was just able to go to the 20th dimension, say, I'm just picking a number, the 20th dimension, but I couldn't stay grounded, there'd be no point to that for me. Right, right. Because we're tethered to the earth for this experience. Right. And, and often in this development of galactic consciousness, people want to spend all the time out in the stars but we chose to have an incarnation on this planet at this time in this way because we knew this was a an amazing time to be on this planet earth while everything's going on in the way it is even if it doesn't feel like it it's an amazing time for us to really take our liberation back it's a really amazing time for the, the collective um, awakening and it's also an opportunity to really honor that um, we're not we're not all these things and and honor our star heritage but we could have chosen to be an amoeba in space mm. but as free will beings we volunteered even if we don't think we did we volunteered to come here for this and it's important that we know this is the place that we're connected with and the soul consciousness of the earth is part of this journey helping each of us to become a star hmm. oh, i have so many more questions <laughs> maybe we will do a part two i don't know we were talking about that earlier before we hit record because i just have so many questions for you um this is so fascinating paulina i love this conversation um oh, enjoy. good questions tricky ones <laughs> yeah i mean i could feel like we could go to deep on some of these things that i just scratched the surface on with the uh question answers 
Um, but before we go, please, how do the listeners contact you? Via my website, um, okay. www.matrixharmonics.com. Um, it does link into the Earth Whisperer and me, Paulina Halford. They all link together, but w, Matrix Harmonics is the one it will come up as. Um, on that, you can find a contact page if you want to email me, or you can um, find me on Facebook. Find me either by um, my name, Paulina Halford, um, or Personal Planetary Healing, or that, that links in from the, my Matrix Harmonics website. Um, and there's also pages like Cosmic Conversations. And if you're interested in some other talks I do, you'll find them on my website under conferences and talks. And um, okay. some of those oh. might, might be okay. interesting to have a listen to. And, and I'm really clear that when I'm talking about things, I'm talking about things from my direct experiences. And if people's direct experiences are different, I don't hold a position on what my, whether my truth is more, more correct than anyone else's. You know, I think our journey about spirituality is about direct experience. And so I'm discussing what I understand from my direct experience. Yeah. But, but not trying to say that's how it is and, and everything else is wrong or they're right and I'm wrong or excuse me, I, anything like that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, and also, would you mind mentioning the name of your book? Because you do have oh. a book, even though it's not about your near death experience, but right it's no no maybe you... um, I've, I've got one of those on the on the go but um oh, no, okay this, i can show you the cover actually it's called remembering isis can you see that yes so i can what... read yes. remembering, remembering isis. isis reconnecting the divine feminine at the goddess temples of malta so this book um and that picture i took of one of oh well, here we go <laughs> make, make, make back anyway on the front of it is a te- one of the temples in malta Okay. So with the mediumship and psych- and psychic work that I do, um, and it's all for me about the divine consciousness, everything is divine consciousness experiencing itself. And the more we can understand that, um, the more we can develop our sense of who we are and who we're not. And um, mm. working with the soul of the earth is that historic process of helping us to be liberated. And the goddess temples in Malta, um have all a lot of the history well they have all the history and they're also quite galactic and so i work with different sites and that book came about after working in those uh, particular energy frequencies and the raising of the divine feminine consciousness around the planet Mm. so that was the focus of that book and other books that i and articles and things they focus on different things um, but wow. so it has a little bit of information about how you do things when you're working with the earth and how you interact with guardian spirits and things like that. But it's generally a form of a pilgrimage so that um, it can be because it was it was tricky. I knew that there were going to be some topics that I would cover that maybe people wouldn't think are important because, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, you've got to pay your mortgage. You've got to do all these things. Um, but yeah. divine feminine to me is, is, is important and it's that part of that remembering. So that's why the remembering is really, really important because it's not just to remember in your mind, it's remember cosmically and it's to bring the threads together. So you're remembering, you're putting all the membered, dismembered bits back together. Okay. So I very cool and i'm going to put these links in the video description for anybody who's listening and they're trying to type it all out real quick yeah i will i'll write it out if anyone's into tarot cards and whatever i do have a soul whispers card deck as well which so like things like I i take pictures and then i write little bits of wisdom on it um so yeah it's basically a a soul whispers deck and uh you can use it to learn what your soul's trying to teach you and um, b- before we close out, any yeah. other last words, Paulina, anything that you're thinking, oh, I just, I really feel like I wanted to get this one more thing across. I just want to give you that opportunity. Um, oh, the, <laughs> I'm making thing, you talk far too much. <laughs> the thing that I would say, which is really, we, we I, I mentioned, you know, we all volunteered and it, we are living in a time where, where many people are being challenged. 
and we're living at a point of reference where some people are giving up or they wonder what it's all about yes and they're frightened and all those sorts of things and it it's a really tough time for people and I really really honor that and really understand that and in the bigger picture it may seem like everything's gone to pot so to speak mm -hmm. but actually on on a bigger picture level we've got this this is part of our collective um spiritual awakening and it it's going to take as long as it takes but as it ha as it moves forward mm -hmm. we are becoming more and more shiny every single one of us and our divine spark is getting bigger and bigger and the, the sense of where that leads us as a form of a species and a human community is profound and limitless mm -hmm. and if we can hold on to that and keep keep in our minds and hearts that love is the foundation of all that is when we feel rocky when we feel broken when we feel lost just remember that love is the foundation and let that mm -hmm. settle in your heart and that can be helpful as we go forward in this time together because this is about us coming together as a species and as a collective mm. Thank you, Paulina. That's so encouraging. Oh, I really appreciated this and you. And thank you to everyone watching. Uh, this has been Julie McVeigh with Unordinary Made Ordinary. And I hope you'll join us next time for another amazing interview. If you did um, like this, please give it a thumbs up and then uh, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this type of content. Um, I hope you are all having a wonderful day or evening uh, wherever you are on the planet or off the planet. And we will see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.